As motoring moves us progressively towards the future and we invest in the very latest technological marvels, inevitably more and more of us will be driving electric vehicles. But servicing, repairing and maintaining electric vehicles involves specialist tools, parts, training and diagnostic equipment. So today I'm going to borrow Bosch's workshop so I can service the air conditioning system on a fully electric Nissan LEAF safely and without killing myself. Now, just like ICE cars, EVs have AC systems. In fact, they often rely on more complex systems called heat pumps to move heat and cold around the vehicle depending on the ambient temperature and what the passengers, the batteries and, of course, the electric motor require. Unfortunately, this LEAF has an issue with its AC compressor, but fixing it is definitely not the same as with an ICE car. The first thing I need to do is get trained up to level three. Right then, so now I'm fully qualified to test and replace parts on a full EV or hybrid car. The next thing we need to do is actually remove the refrigerant from the air conditioning system on our Nissan LEAF. Now you can see you've got your two little in and out sort of ports there if you like, but there's also more importantly a little sticker just here and that's going to let me know exactly how much refrigerant I need to have in the system. It's just about 800 grams and also what refrigerant it's going to be and in this case is R134A. Now, because we're in the Bosch workshops, we get to use the very latest in their air conditioning service units. And we've got the two here because the ACS 753 is actually designed for R134A refrigerant, but the ACS 863 is designed for the more modern 1234YF refrigerant. And the reason that matters is because obviously all the latest vehicles, electric vehicles, are going to be using this refrigerant. But of course, our old Nissan Leaf has been around quite some time, and so it needs to have the R134A. Now, the reason that matters is we don't really know the full service history of our Nissan LEAF. Now, if there's been a problem with the air conditioning system in the past, somebody may have actually replaced the R134A gas with R12. Now, it's actually illegal to use that gas in Europe and America nowadays, but the molecules are actually slightly bigger, and so therefore it kind of resists leaking. But the main issue is that R12 relies on a mineral oil, whereas the PoE and PAG oils, of course, are synthetic. So if you were to extract maybe this contaminated gas, if you like, from our car into this machine. It's going to also contaminate the machine, but that mineral oil will do damage to the seals and stuff in the system. And you're going to have to clean the machine, you have to clean the car. It's going to be a real nightmare. So it's important to use a refrigerant identifier just to make sure that the gas you've got in the car is the one you're expecting. And as it happens on our leaf, it is the 134A, which means we can crack on and actually extract it with our machine. So, here we go. Well, that's great. Well, as you'd expect, it's even separated out the oil from the refrigerant, so we can see how much we've got there. And then you can see on the screen, we've got 728 grams of refrigerant that's been removed. Now, we know from the sticker here that actually a full charge would be 850, so it's a little bit low, but also looking at the oil, we've got there 29 millilitres of oil. So again, we know exactly what we're going to have to put back in. So now our air conditioning system is safely discharged, I can now put my level two high voltage training into action and actually make the vehicle safe, make sure that those 360 volts aren't going to do me any harm. Now another great advantage of being in Bosch's workshop is we get to use all their very latest diagnostic equipment. So I've actually connected up a KTS 590, which is a vehicle communication interface, to the OBD2 socket. And that means this device is now talking to the brain, the ECU of our Nissan LEAF. It's also actually got an oscilloscope and a multimeter function on there, but we can come to that some other time. Now what this is doing is now talking wirelessly to this little chap here, the DCU220, a robust diagnostic notebook and on that is the Easytronic Evolution software which is how we're going to communicate with the car. Now the first thing you probably notice is it's got this home screen with all these variable tiles and these tiles are completely customizable and that customization is actually tied to your login. So if you're working in a big workshop then wherever you happen to be working from whatever terminal as soon as you log in it's going to just bring up your particular preferred sort of set of tiles. Now another really useful feature of the Easytronic Evolution is the SDA or Secure Diagnostic Access. Now this is unique to Bosch, they've done agreements with 24 OEMs so far and basically when you think about 
about modern cars. They've got lots of computer systems on there, and of course they're vulnerable to hackers. So the manufacturers have been adding firewalls, and that of course prevents you getting access to some of the functions on the ECUs. So the SDA allows you to get that access so you can actually diagnose or fix problems on the car. You wouldn't otherwise normally be able to do that. And all you have to do to get access to that is register to single key ID. Now at the moment you can see only a couple of them are actually available to use and that's because we haven't actually put in a car yet. So if I just do that, now as you can see on this next page you now have some entry bars for the information about the vehicle. You can actually source the VIN number directly from the car itself electronically but unfortunately this leaf is a little bit too old for that. Also coming very soon you'll actually just be able to type in the number plate and of course that's also going to give you that information. In this particular case we're just going to type in the VIN number and then you can see straight away we've now actually got the correct vehicle just down here. So, so we're happy with that, so we're going to click on that. So now you can see that home screen has come back up with lots more functionality, loads more tiles you can click on, except there is still one that's actually greyed out, and that is the original documentation. Now that is really a duplication of a lot of the information that will be already stored here, but it's actually the original documents from the car when it was first manufactured, all the manuals and that kind of stuff, and it's being rolled out as we speak, so sometime soon, the Nissan Leaf will also be included in that information. But actually what I'm looking for now is kind of the safety procedure when it comes to actually decommissioning the high voltage battery. So the first thing I want to do now is actually push manuals and then... So you can see here you've got electrical energy management, manual, high voltage, de-energisation applies to vehicles, hybrid or electric drive. Right, so we now have the full procedure obviously from the manufacturer as to how to safely decommission that high voltage supply. Before I do any of this though, because obviously the first thing is saying actually remove the ignition, what I actually need to do is cordon off the area, put up some signage, and make sure I'm wearing all the right gear. Now the reason they say 10 minutes is because even though we've disconnected all of the high voltage cables, obviously the capacitors in the inverter could still theoretically be fully charged and they need to discharge before it's actually safe to work on. So leave it 10 minutes just to be sure and it's a perfect opportunity to have a nice cup of tea, maybe watch one of our videos or perhaps do something else. Maybe buy one of my nice books. Signed as well. Doesn't take my shop long to do a five minute job. Oh, look at that. Hard back copy as well. Loads of pictures. Lovely. What a fantastic read. Now I should sign this one, obviously. All the books can be signed. You should remember to subscribe. Subscribe, you know you need to. And of course ring the bell for your notifications. Right then, so I've finished my cup of tea, which means now the capacitor should be completely discharged. And that means the vehicle is now nice and safe to work on. Now obviously the next problem is working out exactly how we're going to get to the AC compressor. It's right down there on the side of the stack and then I should be able to get that connector off and then once I can get the connector off, the high voltage connector, I could then do some tests. But frankly it'd be a lot easier to see what I'm doing with it on the bench. So slightly unconventionally I'm actually going to take that out, get it on the bench and then we're going to do some testing. And this is where my level 3 training kicks in. Safely removing and replacing a high voltage component in a non-live scenario. Right then, this is our potentially broken AC compressor. Now you can see, unlike perhaps a conventional internal combustion engine compressor, there is no pulley because of course it's got an electric motor, but it's a high voltage electric motor. In this case, it's 360 volts. So you've got your, obviously your two ports there for your AC to go in and out. 
and you can see you've got the little connector on the end there of course and in this case it's only two pins because actually this is a single phase motor this is obviously the controller to turn things on and off and to control the valves now obviously this isn't a user serviceable part but there are a few things i can actually test now the first thing is a couple of electrical tests the first one of course if i just turn on our multimeter and just make sure we've got a little beep going on there so i can check for continuity and as you've got continuity there so if I now just connect up to the wires inside, obviously this is being one winding, effectively it should be some kind of continuity, and there isn't. Now normally with a motor you'd expect quite a low sort of resistance, but you'd certainly seem to expect to see some kind of resistance, not an open circuit, which we have here. So that suggests that the actual winding is broken. Now on a three-phase motor, you'd actually check for continuity between each of the three coils because of course ultimately they all end up going to the same common earth so you should actually find some kind of resistance between each you do u and v and then u and w and then perhaps v and w and then that way you should have exactly the same amount of resistance because of course obviously the coils are supposed to be exactly the same so once you've done that check and you're happy or not the next thing to do is to check the insulation resistance now the idea is of course you don't want this high voltage actually making contact with the casing or the rest of the vehicle because of course that's very very dangerous so the next thing we have to do is a high voltage test so i'm going to be putting on my gloves again because it's a 360 volt car i'm actually going to set the multimeter up to 500 volts and i'm just going to pop a thing on the end now because of course these are connected to each other what i can do is i'll just pop that across both hopefully like so and then i can pop onto earth of the casing and if I just hold this button down and you can see there's some numbers forming up there and they're just counting up so what the device is doing if I've is actually pumping 500 volts into our compressor and it's trying to see if there's going to be a short at the moment the resistance let's stop it there is about 350 mega ohms now that's great news actually because the specification for this particular single phase compressor is only above a resistance above one mega ohm so we're very very comfortably okay with that but obviously as we know the actual windings themselves may have a bit of a problem now interestingly this is an early vehicle it's 2012 from 2013 onwards the nissan leaf was fitted with a motor that was three phase and when you'd be checking the resistance of the insulation on the three phase motor then again you would go between u then v then w and earth and once you've done all those three you should end up with actually in that particular specification is actually three mega ohms or more of resistance so again i suspect it'd be much the same it'd be really really good right then so having established there is actually a problem with the electrical side of our electric compressor unfortunately it's not a user serviceable part in fact it'd be much the same problem if there was an issue with the pump itself the bit that's pushing around or the refrigerant so that means we need to replace it with a brand new one but once we put that onto the car and bolted it up there is one last test we have to do the equipotential test and make sure that basically there is no kind of potential difference between all the components that are bolted on to the vehicle and what you do there is you just do again another resistance test another continuity test between the casing of our new compressor and the dc to dc converter and also the casing of this again and also with the motor itself and once we're happy that that is less than 0.1 of an ohm so basically a dead short then we're all good to go so now we've replaced our faulty compressor with a brand new one and we've re-energized the high voltage battery pack we can now recharge our air conditioning system with some new refrigerant but a very important part of that is also the oil so the reason the oil is important is obviously because that compressor is spinning up and working very very hard making lots of heat and cold all at the same time so it's really important that it's actually oiled so it doesn't just fail mechanically so back in the day we used to use r12 refrigerant and with that we used to keep everything lubricated with mineral oils and then we moved on to pag and poe so the polyalkylene glycol and polyester oils and the minerals should never ever meet you should never mix any of them because you end up with this horrible kind of waxy sludge which is of course going to stop everything working so it's very very important that's why we checked it at the beginning to make sure that you've got the right gas and the right oil to go with that now if we have a look on our machine here you can actually see we've got sort of three little pots here now the first pot here just there is the pag so that's the polyalkylene glycol and you've got the poe the polyester oil there but you've also got a uv dye now i've got a little light here you can see when you're looking for a leak it'd be very very hard to see any of that leaking out and of course being a refrigerant gas you're not going to see that either but with this dye it's more like painting it it's gonna make it a lot easier to sort of isolate those leaks but the problem is the older UV dyes were actually a bit conductive. Now having conductive oil obviously could be a real problem and cause a dangerous short. 
So first of all, you need to make sure that when you're putting in some new dye, that actually it's specially designed not to be conductive. Now, actually, interestingly enough, in Teslas, they normally come out of the factory with a slightly orange dye because you know that's non-conductive. But with this color one, you're going to have to check just to make sure you're OK. But of course, we have the same problem with the oils. So the PAG oils are also conductive, whereas the POE are not. And we can test this by using our high voltage insulation tester. I've got some PAG and some PoE in these separate beakers and I'm using some foam as an insulator to hold the two electrodes securely in each of the oils we're going to be testing. So as the Leaf's high voltage battery is 360 volts, I've set the FSA 050 to 500 volts, which is the closest level above the normal conditions for the oil in the Leaf's AC compressor. I'm testing the resistance of the PAG oil first and the meter is showing 20.2 gig ohms of resistance. And now testing the PoE oil at 500 volts, its resistance is greater than 100 gig ohms. That's 1 times 10 to the power of 11. That is a big number, so a lot of resistance. And in fact, it could be way bigger than the 100 gig ohms. So this proves that the PoE oil is a very good insulator. So just for fun, let's try 1000 volts, nearly three times the voltage the oil will have to resist when in the leaf. After a minute of the high voltage trying to break down the oil, the PoE has managed 95 gig ohms, which is still a huge resistance. So now let's try the PAG. And you can see the flashing warning triangle on the left of the screen, and that's to warn me that there's a thousand volts across the probes and going through the oil. The PAG has managed an insulation resistance of only 19.4 gig ohms. Still a big number, but that's only about a fifth of the PoE. Or to put it another way, the PAG oil is at least five times more conductive than the PoE oil, which is why it's important to use only PoE in the air conditioning systems of electric vehicles. So for most modern EVs, we're going to be using R1234YF refrigerant. In this case, we're using R134A. We're going to be going with the PoE, the polyester oil, and of course, our non-conductive UV dye. Right, now that's clear as mud. Let's start recharging the system. Right then, so now we've got a full charge of refrigerant in our AC system. The final thing to do is to check it's actually worked and we've solved the problem. So for that, I'm actually going to turn on the AC to full cold, full speed and recirculation off. And then I want to look in for a temperature of about 10 degrees below ambient. So I've got a thermometer here to check the ambient temperature, which is currently about just over 20 degrees C. So let's turn it on and see what happens. Well, that's cool. Very cool, in fact. Our AC works an absolute dream. But before I can go off for a nice long drive and chill out, unfortunately, another error that came up with a problem with our high voltage contactors. And that is definitely a job for another day. 